Welcome back to Undulations. This is the fourth video in my series about the Arturium Microfreak. In the last three videos, we covered the basics and a lot of things about sound design. And in this video, we're going to extend that using the built-in arpeggiator and sequencer. So I'll be talking about the different arpeggiator modes and the spice and dice controls. And I also want to talk about how to set the modulation matrix up so that you can use a arpeggio or a sequence to modulate other parameters on the microfree. And then I also want to talk about modulation sequences. And this is somewhat reminiscent of what I was doing in the last video, but that was with Ableton Live. So I used an external thing to control the synth parameters as a function of time. With modulation sequences, you can do it all within the microfreak and get a lot of dynamic behavior in that way. And then the last thing, I just want to show that it's really straightforward to set up synchronization between the microfreak and other gear like maybe a Volca or Pocket Operator. And this is a great thing for performance and a lot of fun in general. So let's dive in. All right, so we're just going to start with the init patch, which sounds like this. I'm going to turn on the arpeggiator and throw some notes down. And the default tempo is 110 BPM. Now, take my fingers off, stops. We've got a hold button. You can do that either way. You can put some notes down. If you want to keep them, you can push it. They'll stay or you can push the whole button and put notes down after the fact. Now, if I take my hand off and try to add, it will not let me. So if you want to add, you have to press and then keep at least one finger down. And so I've added over here on the left. Now I can add over here so it's a little bit like a game of tag or something. Now, if you just throw a chord down, there can be ambiguity about the order, so I'm going to carefully put the notes in. And we're in the up mode now. You can also go into the order mode, so that will play like that. And then we've got the random mode, which when you've got a chord that small, you just get a lot of repeated notes. So let's go back to up and then push the octave button to extend the number of octaves. And it's easier to hear what's going on in this case. So that's two octaves, three, four. And then if you go to order, no surprise there, but it really extends the potential of the random by having a bigger octave setting. Now, we've been doing all of this in the monophonic mode, and you can certainly do arpeggios in paraphonic mode. And I like it because you get sort of a nice, uh, blurred sound or harmony, but it really starts to show up more when you increase the octave setting. And if you think about that the paraphony is a four note paraphony, you get sort of a sliding window of the notes. And so as new notes come in through the arpeggiator, then older notes get kind of choked out. And another important feature is the glide, which the paraphonic can kind of make confusing. If we just play a simple arpeggio and then 
turn up the glide a little bit. You can hear it, and then if you bump the octave, you can really hear it. But then in paraphonic mode, you won't hear glide for small arpeggios. So, for example, I've got glide all the way up because it's just, it's not uh, having a note removed so you don't get a glide. And yet, this doesn't mean that you should avoid glide when you have paraphony on because all you really got to do is just bump up the octaves. So this is effectively more notes. And then as you turn on the glide, you'll start to hear it. That's a really nice sound. Now, we've looked at three different arpeggiator modes, up, order, and random. But to make sense of the fourth mode, which is pattern, it's really going to be easier if we learn a little bit about the sequencer on the Microfreak. And to go into the sequencer mode, normally you would press shift and then hit the same button. So that would be like that, and we'd be in sequencer mode. But instead, I want to stay in arpeggiator mode. And what we're going to do is take a arpeggio and put it into a sequence, which is a really cool feature of the microfree. And I should say up front that these buttons hold up order random and pattern, they double as sequencer controls. So you've got like a way to add rests and ties over on the whole button. You can select the A sequence here, the B sequence you select here. This is a record button and this is a play button. Now, let's put on hold. I'm going to drop it down an octave, throw in a chord. And say we really like that and wanted to save it into a sequence, we can do that just as follows. I'm going to hold shift and then press the A button to put it into the A sequence. You press the B button to put it into the B sequence. So, sounds similar, but something that I really want to point out is that it is not identical. And the reason for that has to do with the number of steps. I was doing a three note arpeggio, so that's going to get us up to 15 notes and then it's going to do the first note of the arpeggio and get truncated so you can hear sort of a repeat. Let me back off a little on the sustain. And that becomes even more noticeable if say you had seven notes down on the arpeggiator. So let me go here and uh, we'll hit hold, put that down. At that, so that's seven total. I'm going to put that into sequence A. And you can hear the repeat a lot more definitely there. And that might not be what you want, so what you could do is you could go into the utility and stand in the preset menu. We can choose our sequence length. And it goes, I think, I'm not sure what the low side is, 4, I think it goes up to 64. But if we set that at 14, then it matches the arpeggio that we had, and you don't hear any of that repeat. Now, I'm going to put that back to 16. And the reason that this is important is because you can develop a pattern in the arpeggiator and then save it to the sequencer slot and when you save your preset, then that pattern becomes part of the preset. So it's very useful. Now, what does this have to do with pattern mode? I'm going to put on hold, put down some notes, and we'll go into pattern mode. And sometimes that happens where it just sort of reads the last thing. So what I'm going to do is just put the notes in while I'm in pattern mode. And if you hear that, you might confuse it with random mode, but they are quite different. Random just keeps evolving, keeps changing, whereas pattern mode is a random pattern. And every time I hit something new, it will make a new pattern. And 
And the point is, is that if you find something that you like, like say that for example, now when you hit shift and take that to one of the sequences, pattern mode on the arpeggiator always makes a pattern that matches the sequence length. And so then you don't get any of the truncation issues that I was just talking about. In the manual, they talk about how the pattern mode on the arpeggiator is like a third sequencer, and that makes a lot of sense. And now, the last things to talk about on the arpeggiator are these spice and dice settings. And these are a couple of features that add a lot of variety to your arpeggios, as well as your sequences. The spice and dice can be something that you're using live, or it could be something that you're just using to explore different arpeggios and maybe end up storing some of those as a sequence. But what do they actually do and how do they work? All right, this strip over here is a bend strip. So normally that's for playing and bending. That's what the default is, but you can also use that strip to set the spice setting. And it says I need to activate the arpeggiator first. That is true. And I'll just go ahead and put some notes down and we can hear what happens. And so the manual talks about spice making subtle changes to the octave that your uh, arpeggio is in, and also changes to velocity and the decay release setting as well. And so some stuff punchy, some stuff ringing a little longer. And I kind of feel a little bit of a tempo change in there too. Um, but that's where dice really comes in. So let me back off on the spice a little bit. Now I'm going to pick something fairly reasonable and so you can hear the original arpeggio but it has some variety to it then we're going to get the dice going and what that has more to do with is the sort of structure of the gates as a function of time so when you hit the touch strip while dice is activated it will change the timing of everything save that one into the B. And so now we've got a couple of sequences to work with and can start them. And this is a great point to talk about how the, your presets really become value in terms of the sequencer. And what I mean by that is that you've got an A sequence and a B sequence here, but you can copy your preset right next door. I'm at 202 right now. At 203, I could save this exact same setup and put two different sequences in the A and B for that one. And then you're going to be able to make a smooth transition between them. So that was what I did at the very beginning of the video. Let me just show you how the, um, if I start a sequence like this one, I can go to the B sequence, back to the A, but then when you switch presets, you always move to the A sequence. And so in this case, I'm actually using different synth settings as well. So that's four different sequences that I'm accessing and a lot of changes along the way. Okay, so we're going to get into 
more about sequences and dedicated modulation sequences. But before we do that, I want to say that there is a way that you can use arpeggios and sequences as a modulation source. And as an example of that, what I'm going to do is go over here to the modulation matrix and at the key slash arp point on there, I'm going to go over to the first user setting and set the rate as the target. So now what that's going to do is based on whatever key is pressed or whatever arpeggio note there is, that's going to send a modulation signal and I'm going to use a setting of minus 100. For this key ARP thing, you kind of want to use big numbers. And then I've got that targeting the rate, so it's negative. It's going to slow things down for higher signals, which means higher pitches. So let's set up a arpeggio. We'll turn it on, hit hold, and put some notes on. And for that range, you can't really hear anything, but as you boost the range, You can hear that lag in the tempo. And that's a cool setting, and we're not just limited to something like that. Like, I could come over here and uh, say I didn't want to make a change to the synthesis type. So the type becomes the destination. I'm going to set that to uh, something like uh, just a little above the middle. like two-thirds and uh, so what that's going to do is have whatever key plays determine what the type of synthesis is and you could put a little more effort into setting it up and that sort of thing but I'm just going to basically go with it we'll see how it sounds so hold on and we're still in three octaves So you can imagine getting a lot of cool variety where the, the synthesis mode or some of the other settings track along with whatever melody or sequence you've got going. All right, so let's take a closer look at the sequencer. And I want to mainly focus on step recording, but we can do a real-time recorded sequence up front just so you can see what that's like. Turn the sequencer on and then... I don't have a sequence in the init patch, so I'm just going to hit play, and then it's ready for whenever you hit record. It says real-time recording. This is flashing. Then it's going to be 16 steps at 110, so it's pretty fast. I'm just going to put something in there as a kind of a placeholder. And then I'm going to turn it off to get rid of the recording, turn it back on, and we can add some spice to that, and the dice as well. And let's take a second just to talk about paraphonic and the sequencer. You can certainly do sequences in paraphonic mode, so sequences of chords, basically. Um, but right now, in this case, since I only hit one note at a time, you just get that little bit of blurring. It will enable me, for example, to add a bass note to that. And so you get the idea there where the, you just want your total number of intended notes at a time to be four. And if you go over that, then something is going to get prioritized, mainly the keyboard notes. And I should also briefly mention that pressure is not recorded. Actually, velocity is recorded by the sequence. And so if you want to have that have an impact on the mod matrix, you got to go into the preset and change it so that pressure does velocity rather than aftertouch. And I've normally been turning the sequences on and off from the play button, which is fine, but 
You can also have a lot of control by leaving that off and then using the keyboard to set a root note for your sequence. And that's an automatic way to do progressions on the sequences. So let me go back to uh, what I did for the opening video and we'll have a go at that. All right, so now let's take a look at step recording. I really like this method a lot. It reminds me of doing stuff on a Volca. And uh, we'll go into the sequencer mode. And um, let's see, I'm going to go ahead and hit record. And so now it's automatically goes into step recording. And I'm not sure if that's visible, but this is saying step one of 16. and what I'm going to do is show you that you can immediately set the sequence length right here. So I'm going to take it down to eight. All right. Then I'm going to put a few blue scale notes in here. So this, then I'm going to hit a rest and then another note and another note here. And then for this next one, I'm going to hit it and then hit a tie. So that's six and then seven. And I'll put another rest in. So we can listen to that. So very basic. And so now I'm just going to drop an octave and uh, play it more as a bass line and you could also uh, spice and dice this sort of thing but i'm just going to leave it as is and we'll start uh, playing with it a little bit here i'm going to move a little tweaking And then you can just use that as a way to follow a chord progression. And I'm going to save that so that what we can do is, um, let's see, call it a bass. Uh, I'm just going to call it a knit A, and that'll be easy. And we can use that as a starting point when we look at modulation sequences. All right, so now it's time for the modulation sequencing. And I feel like this is a great feature of the Microfreak. And my preference so far, at least, has been to do the notes of the sequence in step recording and then do the modulation sequences by real-time recording them. Now, you can do stepwise modulation sequences as well, and you can do editing of modulation sequences of the sequences themselves. And there's a lot in the manual about how to edit, save, clear, all that sort of thing. It's nicely done. So check that out. But right now we're going to be in init A where I've got a slightly different sequence than when we left off. I added eight more notes to it so that we have a little bit more time for the motion sequencing. Uh, there I am calling it motion sequencing, which is sort of a Volca thing. It is quite reminiscent of a Volca, but modulation sequencing. Okay, so we'll go with that. And then it's worth making the point that you should start with your parameters where you want them before you record them. 
So right now I'm going to darken the filter quite a bit. It'll be like that. And I'm going to lengthen the decay. And so then what we're going to do is go ahead and hit record. And I'm going to sweep that filter. I feel like that turned out pretty good. And then now I'm going to hit record again to do another knob, the decay. I'm going to kind of close out the decay a little bit as it goes. Okay, so I feel like that, that sounds pretty good. And so now what we're going to do, turn it off and we can play from the keyboard. All right, so this is just scratching the surface of modulation sequencing on the Microfreak. It's a really powerful feature and you can do up to four different knobs. So that's four modulation tracks as well as the paraphony, which gives four note tracks. So there's a sort of symmetry to it. And I think that you can get a lot of cool performance aspects out of the Microfreak. And I really like the sound overall. And if there's any sort of question about the Microfreak that you have or some feature that I didn't cover, then feel free to leave a comment below and I will get back to you about it. All right, so I've really enjoyed doing these videos on the Microfreak. I feel like that the interesting design choices from Arturia, like the capacitive keyboard and the spice and dice and just the little bits and pieces of it really make it a unique device. And yet it's also got some really solid synthesizer components like different synthesis modes, nice envelope stuff, and also I feel like the modulation matrix really just sort of ties the whole thing together. It gives a lot of potential for sound design. That's great. But in these videos, I've been doing a lot of more up-tempo, kind of bouncy type stuff. And I find myself wondering, can it go slower? Can it do smoother, more ethereal types of sounds? I'm pretty sure that it can. And that's a segue into a channel update that I want to share with you guys, which is that I've been going at a pretty good clip for the last 10 plus videos, something like uh, eight days between uploads on average. And I'm fine with that. That has been great. I've really enjoyed it, but I want to do more. And there's been some feedback about, I guess, the soporific sound of my voice. And I've said sort of from the get go that I wanted this channel to be relaxing, something that people enjoyed listening to. And so with all that in mind, four or five days from now, I'm intending to upload a five to 10 minute ambient track with some visuals to go with it. And it's just something that I think I'll enjoy doing and hopefully you guys will enjoy watching, listening to. And then four or five days after that, I intend to be back in more of this type of video and won't be with a micro freak, but some other piece of gear. And I feel like this alternating content will be good. I think I will learn a lot from doing it that way and hope to share that with all of you. So thanks a lot for watching. Hey, I didn't forget about syncing the Mic Freak up with external gear like a Volca or Pocket Operator. Here we are. And first thing I want to say is that I found that I needed to go into the utility and then go down to the sync settings and under the clock, I changed it to 2 PPQ, that's I think pulse per quaver or something like that. That was not the default, so need to do that for these devices. I feel like it works good. And uh, then the other thing, to say that on a Volca, there's no setting, but with a pocket operator, there is a sync setting. You can look it up in the PO manual, and I'm using sync setting 2 over here. And this is just an audio cable. I think a mono cable works as well. 
going from the sink out on the, uh, is it called sink out? Maybe it's clock out on the microfreak and then coming into the tonic over here. I didn't set up a mixer or anything like that. I'm just going to hold the speaker up to the voice mic. That'll be how we hear the tonic pocket operator. And so uh, let's go. Oh, I'm <laughs> hi. I don't have the synth plugged in. Okay, now let's go.